¿Qué pasa, campeones? We are back with episode number two. And look who's sitting here. No, here. On the right or left of me, depending which way you're looking at it. It's Andrea Orlandi. We're ready to kick off episode two of the restart of D-Spot. Let's get it cracking. What's going on, Andrea? How you doing today, my friend? I'm all right, Diego. How are you doing? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. As you can see, it's another week where my hair is just a little bit more out of control. I'm trying to make sense of it all, but uh, I've just decided, man. I've told you already, I'm going to let it grow. Let it grow. I'm gonna go, go with the flow. Uh, you're looking good, amigo. You can do anything you want with those <laughs> blue eyes. <laughs> Just let it grow. <laughs> Just letting it grow. That's right. I'm going to grow it over my eyes. So you're going to be. No, able don't to do that, though. Don't do that. <laughs> Anything but, that, but this. <laughs> well, it is good to have you back, Andrea. I'm very excited to have uh, this opportunity to talk to you again a second time on D Spot. Uh, you see it over here. No, I need to get used to this reflective image over here give andrea and myself a follow on our social media this is our both twitter and instagram handle in the case of andrea so uh give us a follow and andrea on today we're going to be discussing three topics again we're going to try to keep it to a 30 minute limit so we're going to be flying through three I think very interesting topics topic number one is yes la liga returns the date has been Almost set in stone, I would say. Either June 11th or 12th, La Liga will be back with, well, what is possibly, in my opinion at least, the most passionate and one of the most exciting derbies in the world, Sevilla against Betis. We're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about the injury, uh, potential in injury problems that uh, many players will be facing. And in the end, we're going to be talking a little bit about Lance Armstrong and comparing him with Leo Messi. Of course, ESPN has released a two-part documentary after their fascinating uh, The Last Dance about Jordan's Bulls. They've also released uh, uh, this new documentary about Lance Armstrong. It's a two-part documentary, uh, if I'm not mistaken. The first part was four hours long. So we're going to be talking a little bit about that, where we're going to start with La Liga. Andrea, as I mentioned, Tebas has, has announced that La Liga will return, uh, and it's going to return with a banger that is Sevilla Betis. What a start. Well, what a start. Uh, first of all, I'm very happy with the news. You know, we were all looking forward to it. And finally, we've got La Liga back. Uh, and obviously, you know, there's no a better start than uh, with the Sevilla derby. You, you said it is one of the best derbies in the world, and I absolutely agree with you. Uh, one of the ingredients that normally makes it even better won't be there, uh, the fans. Yeah. Uh, but now we can, we're kind of getting used to it, you know, watching the Bundesliga uh, without crowds and without the noise. Uh, but obviously, on the pitch, uh, they will leave everything out there. I mean, Sevilla and Betis, they hate each other. I mean, the rivalry goes beyond <laughs> any limit. And, and I'm sure that the players will, will be throwing out everything out there. And, and I'm expecting a really good game. So we, we'll start with, uh, you know, with uh, one of the greatest games that you can uh, witness in, in La Liga. And, uh, and obviously, I'm expecting, uh, let's say, uh, not not a we call it not a decaf derby, uh, but uh, you know with no fans, uh, with the injuries, uh, you know the shadow of injuries there, you know players La Liga players watching at the Bundesliga thinking well, you know we don't want to do or don't we don't want to be there, you know in terms of uh, or niggling injuries or because if you miss uh, if you get injured once then you're gonna miss uh, the rest of La Liga because it's only 11 games in a very short period of time. Exactly. Uh, but anyway, uh, there's full of uh, full of passion, mm -hmm. even if the fans are not there. Full mm -hmm. of quality. Mm -hmm. Sevilla and Betis, uh, both rosters are full of quality, and, uh, and obviously, I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, and, and you touched upon it there. There's obviously a, a very bitter and historic rivalry between these two sides, therefore making it one of the uh, most exciting and electric derbies in the world. Uh, and you touched upon an interesting topic there. I like your choice of words because you said they're going to go out and leave it all out there. They're going to give it their all in this derby. But uh, at, in the same sentence, you talked about the injuries. Um, and uh, I guess that already leads us to uh, our, our next topic here of injuries because I'm going to share your, my screen with uh, you here, Andrea. Although, 
I don't think that you'll be able to see it, but the viewer certainly will be because um, injuries is certainly one of the big hot topics uh, now that football has returned and for good reason because ever since the Bundesliga has come back uh, and we see it here, I actually counted all of the injuries that uh, players have suffered from all of the teams competing in the Bundesliga ever since uh, uh, the, the, the Bundesliga returns actually I should say the month of May so I counted the entire month of May which is a little bit before the games officially uh, were restarted so it's it's taken into account some of the uh, 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 I guess practice days you can call it it's here the information brought to us by teamfeed.co.uk and as you can see they've got a, a, a very organized uh, graph here of all of the teams and the players that have picked up an injury and the dates that are um, that that are here to the to the right of them you can see and i counted it for you andrea so we can already skip ahead we're not gonna have to go one by one through each player but i counted a total of 31 uh players that have picked up an injury 31 players in a month in the month of may this month of may that have picked up an injury obviously it's ranging between uh, 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 short-term injuries and more severe injuries um my question is how do you think the players mentally will be affected knowing that they are at a higher risk to pick up an injury. Will they be really going 100%? Well, uh, this is what I was trying to explain. I, I couldn't make myself clear. Obviously, in a derby, they'll want to leave everything out there. But thinking uh, thinking about those uh, those injuries that happen in the Bundesliga, you, you actually try to... You know, you don't want to get out second gear because uh, you know that something might happen. And I'm sure that mentally players think about that. Uh, so now for me, uh, more than coaches, uh, you know, uh, fitness coaches are going to are gonna be the, win uh, the league winners, the ones that are going to keep uh, teams in La Liga, uh, you know, the ones that are going to make the difference. Why? Uh, because preseason is, is a crucial time. Is where you you get ready and prepared for the rest of the season. Now we've had to stop because we all know this COVID-19 situation. So you've been at home for two months, training on your own, but you can't compare what you do at home with what you do on the pitch. Hmm. Having said that, you don't have pre-season -pre games, you know, to prepare for the competition. So you start uh, you start already with a competitive game. So your body is not prepared for that. Uh, and you talked about uh, me the mental side of it. Mentally, you're not prepared either. Mm -hmm. So if physically you're not prepared, mentally you're not prepared either, you know, mm -hmm. that combination, uh, the risk of injury is higher. It's massive. And, and, listen, and, we, know, and I, we know how important the mental, the, 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 the state of mind, the mental plays a factor. I mean, just look at Dembele, for example. A lot of the, the, the physicians and doctors have said that, yes, indeed, his mental, uh, say, frailness has been affecting his injuries as well. Yeah, with Dembele, I've got my own theory, hmm. but we can talk about it uh, on another podcast. Okay. Uh, and, and I think it's more about the way of training at Barca uh, that affects him more than the mental side of it. Okay. Uh, but when you play at Derby, you play it 100%. Uh, you know, you, you don't want to think about the injuries, but in the back of, of your mind, if I was a Betis or a Sevilla player, uh, you know, I couldn't give my all because the risk of an injury is so high. Uh, you know what I mean? And there is so much at stake that you want to be fit for the rest of the 10 games in La Liga. Yeah. So, uh, and it's something that it's happened in the Bundesliga as well, uh, especially in the first, uh, the first two games where teams were playing, but they weren't sure. Really, you could see players, you know, wanting to do more, but hey, let's keep it easy because we've got more games coming on. Uh, and this affects the show as well and the quality of, uh, of, of the football. Uh, so, I think it's a big question mark. I think the managers need to be very good at uh, rotating the squad, uh, you know, obviously not uh, every single team in La Liga have the players that probably Barca and Real Madrid got. Yeah. So Zidane and Kike Setien are lucky because they can rotate the squad and, and pick really good players for every game. Mm. Most of the teams cannot do that, but they, they have to. Yeah. They have to because it's better to play, uh, you know, your best players uh, once a week, even if, it's, if there's more than a game that just play them all the time and then have the risk of losing them for the rest of the season. So, uh, you know, it's about finding the right balance and sure. it's a very tricky, it's a very tricky uh, scenario. And that's why I think the fitness coaches are key uh, because now what do you want to do? You want to train, you, you have to focus for an 11, 11 game season. Yeah. So you need to be fresh. You need to result, uh, you need to have results straight away. You need, you don't need to train as hard 
as you do in a normal preseason. Mm -hmm. So I think the best fitness coaches are going to make the difference for me. Okay, okay. Um, in the case that some of the viewers are hearing uh, baby noises and toddler screams in the background, my apologies. But yes, uh, I do have two kids in the house and uh, it's very hard to contain them or entertain them during these days of isolation and uh, quarantine. So my apologies and, for that. And I've got four, four dogs as well. So if <laughs> you hear some crazy barking, I apologize. Four dogs? For Four dogs. Here. Jesus, yeah. Andrea, man, that's a lot yeah. of dogs, man. Yeah, three was not enough. I mean, we got four. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of walking and dog food. My God. I know. I know. I mean, I know, I've man. had I've had three dogs. We've had three dogs over a span of, of ever since I was a little kid to, uh, uh, until I left the house and I was you know eighteen or something like that. But but you know never three at a time, let alone four. Are they big yeah. dogs? Yeah, we got a big one, and then we got like the three sausage dogs. Ah, the, 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 okay. Those. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I would they're imagine funny. that they're makes funny, a difference. But just keep barking and barking. Uh, they're not very well educated, I have to say. <laughs> well, neither are my kids, so uh, but I, I do my best. Um, but Andrea, with with, with the risk of uh, um, say long term injury. Uh, being quite high and obviously playing so many match so many matches in a condensed period of time uh, uh, that adding to the risk factor of picking up a potential long-term injury let's talk a little bit about the minor injuries that are easier say camouflaged or covered up um, as a multitude of players have been doing for many years uh, here in Spain it's quite a special term that they use for this it's a uh, Juan Jugar infiltrado or playing infiltrated. Now, in the context of sports uh, and sports injuries, it refers to the injection of various drugs at or near the injury in order to, de to decrease the pain uh, and or inflammation for a time and delay the time of rest or surgery. Um, now, how common? Or let, let me ask you this, Andrea: What what drugs are they referring to here? Well, uh, you know, I can talk about myself from my own experience, and I have played infiltrado. Mm -hmm. I've had injections to, to numb the pain in order to play, you know, in the weekend, sometimes even to train, uh, because the pain was, uh, was that, that bad, you know. Mm -hmm. And it is common in football. The thing is, uh, I'm not saying it is a good thing to do. I'm not saying that we don't know the risks uh, behind it, because what you do is actually you're masking uh, the real problem. Yeah. So it gets you through uh, the game or the training session, but then the problem is always there, and you you end up making it even worse. Uh, so what what they do it's uh, it's probably cortisone sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, anti-inflammatories, uh, anesthetics uh, in order to to make you play. And I've got an anecdote about myself um, where I, I I had plantar fasciitis. I don't know if you if you ever had this. No. Where I couldn't. I wasn't even able to walk. I mean, there was a, I tried uh, the day before the game, uh, I, I walked out on the pitch and I said to the coach, listen, I cannot walk. I mean, there's no way I can play tomorrow. Please, it's a very important game. We need you tomorrow. What well, I'll do, I'll ice it. I'll take anti-inflammatories. I'll do everything I, I possibly can. So I woke up the next morning. I couldn't, I couldn't walk down the stairs. And the, the pain was where exactly? In, in your knees or in, in the foot? In, or? in the foot. In the foot, you know, okay. Uh, in the foot. It's the, the plantar fasciitis. It's in the in the soul yeah mm -hmm. so i couldn't i couldn't i couldn't plant my foot on the on the ground so i couldn't walk mm -hmm. uh, imagine running mm -hmm. well in the morning i felt slightly better so i turned up to the stadium uh, and as i'm go i'm going out for the warm up pam no impossible you know the pain was that much so the doc a doctor turns up we didn't have a doctor at the time we had a part time doctor and i said you know what what we can do we'll put some anesthetic there mm -hmm. in order to make you play now that was my left foot i'm left footed me too. And I, 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 yeah, okay, so I was the one taking the corners, the free kick. Yeah. And this doctor comes with this big needle and he just, <laughs> he just puts something there. <laughs> Listen, and I started feeling, you know, some heat coming up on my leg. Mm -hmm. So he numbed my leg from, from the sole up until my knee. So I didn't feel my, my whole leg for the entire game. So I played a game without feeling the ball every time I was touching. Now, That's crazy. is this good? That's crazy. It's not good. Did I regret it after? I did, hmm. because I didn't, I didn't help the team. I did uh, make it worse, because after the game, my plantar fasciitis was broken. So wow. I, I ended up pulling it, uh, you know, yeah. uh, ripping it. Yeah. And then I was out for three weeks. Wow. So uh, sometimes it is stupid, but you as a player, because you want to play, you are so competitive. Right. You know, if you don't play, there's someone waiting to take your place. Yeah. 
uh, that you would do anything, uh, you know, to be fit and play. So it is a common thing. It is a common thing. And I know cases of La Liga players that they've, they've been taking injections to play yeah. for a very long, uh, long period. Yeah. Uh, and now they've needed to have surgeries in the case of Luis Suarez, for example. Well, that's the name I was actually going to bring up. Uh, that's the, the, the first name that popped into mind when you started to talk about this. And, and, and from a fan perspective, it's, it's very frustrating, uh, for example, to hear uh, Valverde himself, when he was still the manager of Football Club Barcelona, admitting in a press conference, uh, or, or not necessarily admitting, but, but stating that Luis Suarez had been playing injured for pretty much the entire season and I think seem to remember at this point when he said that in the press conference it was either before or after a Champions League clash in the knockout phase. I remember Valverde saying this and I remember just my jaw dropping to the floor knowing that Luis Suarez or, or, or at least the rumbling around the campfire was that he was playing injured but I was always thinking is he, I mean, how could somebody, how could a manager or Luis Suarez himself allow a player to continue to play uh, and risk, you know, making his injury worse by playing, as you call it, infiltrated? I mean, why would, why would a manager or the player himself even, even do that or allow him to do that? I mean, there is some areas where the risk is higher or, or less, you know. So okay. uh, let's say Suarez, the problem was the knee. Hmm. So actually yeah. the risk was... The risk was high. Massive, yeah. Massive, yeah. But then, uh, if he has an operation and he's out for four or five months, uh, you never know how you come back from a, from an operation, mm -hmm. especially in the knee. He, he was at, at a point where, at his age, uh, you know, these kind of situations are a bit difficult to deal with. Yeah. So he decided himself of, okay, I won't have an operation. He had it before the Copa America. Uh, and, he's had it, and he's had it now because the pain was too much. Mm -hmm. But he'd been carrying, uh, carrying uh, this situation on for a long time, uh, even in training. I know for a fact that he would just run out for training. Oh, no, it's too painful. Come back in, take an injection and train. Uh, but this is down to Luis Suarez, his character, you know, not wanting to give up. So are you, are wanting... you applauding that or, or do I'm, you frown I'm, upon I'm, that? I mean, where do you stand on this? I'm not applauding that, but I've been a player myself and I've done it. Hmm. Uh, yeah. And it's in our nature. We don't want to give up. Mm -hmm. And I mean, uh, you want to be there. You, you just want to help your teammates. And you know that if you're not out there, yeah. uh, you know, the team is going gonna, is gonna to be affected by, uh, by your injury, by your absence. So uh, I think that uh, you're not playing at your 100%. Uh, for sure, we've seen Suarez playing, and you, you could you could see there was something there that was wrong. Mm, yeah. Uh, but at the same time, uh, not having Suarez is is a big blow for Barcelona. So. So you think that an, a, a a I mean I I don't want to put a percentage on it, but but let me just do it for fun. Let's say uh, Luis Suarez at 70, 80 percent of his capabilities is or was better than. Who did they have on the bench at the time? Was it Boateng? Well, they had or... Boateng, yeah, right. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Even, a, even, even a 50% Suarez, <laughs> I, I, I would say. Boateng, but not that he watches said, this, you, as, but as, that's Andrea who said that, not me. <laughs> I say it, I say it. Sorry, Prince. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I've been, a, I've been a player myself, and, uh, and I can understand why Suarez uh, has been doing this. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying he's right. I'm not saying that when I took injections, it was the right thing to do. Mm. Uh, but man, I didn't want I didn't want to let the fans down. I didn't want to let the, uh, my teammates down. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted I just wanted to be there. I just wanted to be fit to play and help. Uh, but I, I tell you one thing: if my performances weren't good, if those injuries weren't allowing me to play good, I was the first one to raise my hand and say, "Listen, I won't take any injections. I'll have my operation, or I'll stay my three four weeks out." And then I'll come back when I'm fully fit. Okay, well, let's move on to uh, the uh, third and final topic because I think this uh, uh, is a nice little transition to talk about Lance Armstrong. And uh, we're going to be talking about Lance and Leo in just a minute. But I want to touch uh, still upon this, or I still want to delve a little bit deeper on the topic of cortisone. Um, and I'm going to be playing this clip because of the many illegal substances uh, that Lance Armstrong tested positive for. One of those ones was cortisone. And uh, I want to pull up this little clip from uh, the Jalen and Jacoby podcast for the viewers to listen to. Uh, and then I'm going to ask you some questions about it too, Andrea. So uh, let me once again just share the screen here. 
and have a let's have a listen. Of course, it never works as smoothly in the live as it does in the rehearsal, but uh, here we go. And at one point, he tested positive for cortisone. And there's a lot of people that suspected him. And at one point, he tested positive for cortisone. And there's a lot of people that suspected him of using performance-enhancing drugs. Ah. He tested positive for cortisone, which he clearly was using as a performance enhancing drug. But he explained it away as saying, you know what? I used that as a pain reliever for the saddle sores I was getting during racing. And the head of the cycling basically turned a blind eye to that. Do you think there was sort of an institutional blind eye turn to his performance enhancing use that was helpful for the sport, helpful for the money, helpful for the bottom line that allowed it to happen? So. Now, uh, Jacoby here is uh, uh, in this topic of uh, uh, using cortisone uh, and talking about how, you know, the Federation turned a blind eye because it was helpful for the sport. Obviously, Lance Armstrong was, let's say, like the Michael Jordan or the Leo Messi for cycling, obviously promoting the sport or the Tiger Woods of, of, of you know, cycling and promoting the sports, the sport like maybe nobody had ever done before. But one word that stood out to me there, Andrea, is performance enhancement drug. They talk about cortisone as if it is a performance enhancement drug. Is it or is it not? Well, I, I, listen, I'm not an expert on, on cycling, so I don't know that the effects of cortisone could have on, on cyclists. But, you know, talking about football, that is my, uh, my topic. And my, on my experience, you know, taking cortisone has never enhanced uh, my performance or the performance of a football player. What it does, it just numbs the pain. Uh, it's more like... Uh, you use it, use it as a, an anti-inflammatory, uh, and that's it. Uh, but it's not gonna make you, uh, you know, hit the ball better, make better crosses, or run faster. Uh, obviously, in cycling, I, I don't know the effects it can have on uh, on a cyclist. But you know, I'm talking about footballers. Mm. Uh, I don't see it as a as a drug, as a performance enhancing drug. You know, that makes you uh, play better or have uh, better performances. So. If I ask you if cortisone should be seen as a treatment or a license to cheat, uh, you obviously would be inclined to say, well, it's definitely a, 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 um, a treatment and I would never consider it a license to quote unquote cheat. Whereas in the world of cycling, and again, you, I mean, you stated that you're not uh, uh, necessarily maybe the, the, the right person to talk about the, what in the world is of cycling is considered cheating or not. But I guess I'm gonna re ask you the question again, why do you think that in cycling it is so frowned upon if at the end of the day it's not a performance enhancement drug because it doesn't boost any sort of you know uh, uh, it doesn't make your muscles uh bigger it doesn't make you cycle faster all it does is really numb the pain which in all the other sports is allowed in football and, and in basketball and american football rugby etc yet if armstrong claims that and i'm going to be maybe crude here my wording but saying his ass is hurting because he's been sitting on a very uncomfortable bike chair for i don't know how many ungodly hours you know riding up a mountain uh, that you should be skiing down from instead of riding up from and, and 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 he uses a little bit of cream or whatever it might be a pill or injection of cortisone to numb the pain in his ass a little bit i don't see the problem there so again i'm just I, a little I bit confused i don't see it I don't see it either. I mean, I've got my spinning class. It's 30 minutes, and then my ass is hurting. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. <laughs> like hell. So I'd love to use a cream just to numb that pain. Yeah. So I don't know if it's got different effects. I mean, it, it sounds funny to talk about cortisone when, when he was having blood transfusions, uh, using EPO, uh, the yeah. human growth hormone, and all sorts of drugs. Uh, I don't know why there is all this you know, this big case with, uh, with cortisone. I don't know what the effects of it. I know from my own experience when I first started uh, more than 15 years ago, uh, doctors used to uh, use it a lot. Where by the end of my career, I didn't hear or see cortisone at all. Mm, mm, so mm. It, it, it was used a lot, let's say 15 years ago. But nowadays they don't use it anymore because they use like more natural things uh, like PRP injections. I've had plenty of PRP injections for, for injuries. PRP is actually, they take your own blood. Okay. 
they just spin it and then uh, the plasma which is the purest part of it mm. uh, they re-inject it uh, in the area where you have the pain where you have the injury and what it does uh, because it's your your own blood but it's the purest part of it it regenerates the cells so it speeds up the the recovery process okay but it, it is completely natural there's there's nothing there's no drugs there it doesn't make you go faster it doesn't make you play better uh, they put some anesthetic on it as well just to to mask a little bit the pain right and it, it accelerates the process you know the recovery process that's it okay uh, but at the beginning yes they use cortisone more uh, but the effects of cortisone sometimes uh, could be even worse uh, you know for for your recovery okay so well um andrea over here in the uh, and again i'm sharing my screen for the viewers at home i uh, pulled up a, an, an article of uh, or in the guardian that explains a little bit why cortisone in the case of cycling uh, is illegal and they talk about uh, the fact that you need a doctor's prescription that specifically states um, the area that is that needs medical attention let's say and in the case of uh, uh, Lance Armstrong uh, this was a false declaration and uh, eventually the team provided something that was backdated uh, and indeed the excuse was the saddle soreness so well okay I mean it's still it's still for in my case at least raises a, a few question marks at least well, yeah, well, I'll it's... tell you I'll tell you one thing for example mm. in football you can't take if you have a flu or you have a cold, you can't take anything else apart from paracetamol. So okay. unless your doctor prescribes you, uh, I don't know, an antibiotic or something like that, yeah. they, they're not adamant to do so. Yeah. So let's say you have flumethyl, which is something that I used to take when I was younger. Yeah. It's, it's banned. So let's say that I, I've got a flu and I take this flumethyl just to make uh, the flu better and, make my, uh, and feel better in order to train. And then the next day, the guys from the, from the doping uh, testing come I have my test done and then I'm banned for two years because oh. I'm just taking something uh, to feel better because I've got a flu and I can't breathe. Mm. Uh, so the only thing we were allowed to take was paracetamol. That was it. Uh, so I'm not that surprised that cortisone might be banned mm. because if they don't let you take fluimethyl, which is something that kids take. Mm. So what's the point? I mean, there's some rules sometimes are stupid. Mm. Uh, they don't make any sense. It's it's Everything, exactly. It just seems that the criteria is is, the criteria is different is for one Everything sport and the other. Everything you take, you need to you need to say it. Yeah. Let's say you're not going to training. You need to text, uh, you know, the federation and tell them where you're gonna be yeah. because if there is a there is a doping test that day and you're not in training, they don't know it. Mm. Then you're banned. Yeah. So I mean, the rules are so strict. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes they are stupid because. How is fluimethyl, for example, gonna affect my uh, my performances? Yeah. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Or I mean, for that matter, you know, there's cortisone as well, and if you have allergies, for example, now in the spring summertime, you use cortisone as well. Uh, exactly. I guess but it, you can you can't take anything. It's yeah. like uh, paracetamol, and that's it. All yeah. the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, the funny thing is, uh, reading this article, my eyes also gathered upon uh, the human growth hormone, another agent, anabolic agent uh, that Lance Armstrong tested positive for. And here is where we uh, now delve into the topic of making the comparison. And again, I'm using those words maybe lightly and I don't want it to be misinterpreted, but making a comparison between the use of uh, HGH, human growth hormones, between, in this case, Lance Armstrong and Leo Messi. Of course, uh, Leo Messi, most of the viewers will know, uh, was born with a growth deficiency. Uh, his move to Barca was mainly due to the fact that Barca was willing uh, to pay for a treatment which involved the injection of HGH, human growth hormones. And that is not allowed. At least it's not allowed in cycling and it's neither allowed in, uh, if you look at the... Um, uh, if you look at FIFA in the the uh, uh, or what is uh, uh, considered doping officially doping agents by the world uh, the world anti doping agency, we scroll if we scroll down here if I can do it if I remember it correctly here was it hormone metabolic so this includes insulin another no wasn't this one ah here we go uh, so. 
yeah, one of the ones that pops up here in the list of uh, banned substances is EPO, uh, with, uh, EPO, which re creates red blood cells. And here we see HGH, human growth hormones, as an illegal substance uh, under the rules of FIFA. So my question here is, <laughs> why in the case of Leo? Is it applauded, I guess, the fact that he used it? Or if not applauded, at least people turn a blind eye. There's not really people that question the use uh, of human growth hormones in the case of Leo Messi. Why is it because it was allowed when he was a kid? It was something that he needed. Please help me explain this. Well, I think that there is, uh, uh, it's, um, there is therapeutic use exemption uh, in case, uh, you know, for a player, in case it's uh, medically necessary uh, for the growth of, of a person. I mean, Leo was only going to be, uh, you know, taller than my, than my daughters uh, because he had this, uh, this disorder in his growth. Yeah. So he, need, he needed to have the HGH, sorry, to, to actually develop physically and become what he is now. Uh, so it was allowed. Uh, you know, it was it was it was one of those exemptions where, uh, you know, uh, they would allow him to have this treatment. Uh, otherwise, he wouldn't have played football because he, he would have never grown. Now, uh, has this affected Leo's performances on the pitch? We will never know. Obviously, he is Leo Messi now because he, he had this uh, obviously this uh, uh, this treatment. Otherwise, he, he would have never made it into professional football. Uh, New World's old boys didn't want to pay it. River Plate didn't want to pay it. Barcelona, yes, we will pay for it. So it's just when Leo came to Barcelona and started all this process. But I think uh, you and I, you and I, we can agree that Messi wouldn't be the same player he is today without human growth hormones. That is a fact. He wouldn't, he, he wouldn't be a player. He wouldn't be it's a player. Like, and and, he wouldn't and, be and a so player. did human growth hormones, did this treatment accelerate his athletic development? The answer would be yes, correct? Yes, absolutely. Yes, 100%. Now, uh, football is not like athletics or cyc cyclist, cyclism, sorry, uh, where it's more like uh, your fitness that yeah. makes the difference. Now there is a ball and you need talent, uh, you know, to play those, this sport. So uh, I won't say that the HGH -E uh, made Leo Messi the best player in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It allowed him, it allowed him to, to, be, a, uh, to be a football player because he, uh, thanks Thanks for this treatment. Now uh, he was able to grow, uh, but then uh, you need to have the quality. He has to to go out there and perform. Now, how much uh, this treatment has affected his body, his muscle? Uh, you, uh, you know how quick uh, to be the uh, to be as fit as he is, to be as quick as he is, to be as strong as he is. We will never know. Hmm. Uh, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know. No. Uh, this is a uh, this is a question that I can I can't answer. Well, I, I tried to uh, dig a little bit deeper into this topic, and uh, although this is uh, perhaps not the most reliable source uh, in this uh, short period of time that we were uh, preparing for this pod, I did come uh, across the opinion of uh, Frank Butera, who is uh, a man that pub published uh, this answer on uh, Quora.com, and he says the most important effect of growth hormone is height growth. So. He goes on to state that typically treatment is stopped when children have finished puberty and no more growth in height is possible. After that, the adult still has human growth deficiency. Symptoms of GHD in adults include increased fat, uh, lower muscle mass, mild bone loss, thinning of skin, sleep problems, decreased exercise performance, decreased energy, decreased well-being, uh, etc., etc. But it says, he finishes by saying, for many adults, these symptoms are not bad enough for them to want treatment, but some do want to continue growth hormone injections as needed. Um, again, I'm not <laughs> citing this as the best source. You know, it's Quora.com. You're free to uh, uh, state your opinion here as you please. It's uh, not something to be taken uh, as an official statement. But I, I, I suppose, you know, it, it, it does leave me wondering whether or not... Now, some people say that Messi stopped his uh, uh, treatment at the age of 14. Uh, obviously, that is not the age where you stopped growing. Um, if you ask me, uh, when I was at Barcelona hmm. and I was in the dressing room... If I ever heard or seen anything, I'll say no. Never heard of anyone talking about Leo taking 
you know, injections or or having this treatment. Yeah. No, not at all, 100%. Now, I suppose what, what would be interesting to know is, again, in the case of Leo Messi, where he had this growth deficiency, he would have, he needed this uh, 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 th th this treatment because otherwise, like you said, he would be the head of your daughters are right now. In the case of, say, Lance Armstrong, where there is no medical uh, uh, prescription or medical need to apply such a treatment, I suppose maybe that is where the line is drawn and that is where you jump into the Ill illegality of it all. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the only, the only reason why Lance Armstrong was taking it, it was just to enhance his, their, his performances. Right. Uh, there was one more. Uh, as he did the blood transfusions, the EPO, a human growth hormone makes you uh, makes you more competitive. It makes your performances better. So this is this is why he was taken. And there was no medical reason behind it. It was only uh, you know his his inner uh, competitor asking him to be better as, yeah. a, as a cyclist, yeah. and he wanted to win. Leo needed it just to grow. Yeah. Because exactly. it was gonna be, it was gonna be very short. It wasn't gonna be able to play football. Yeah. Uh, and everyone knew it. Yeah. So I don't know up until when uh, it took this treatment. When I was at Barca, I never saw it. Never mm. heard of it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 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 It's a, it's an interesting topic. There's such a fine line between, uh, I guess, you know, what can be considered hypocrisy or what is legal, what is illegal. Uh, you know, I think with human growth hormones, uh, with that, it's rather clear. But in the case of cortisone, I still have my questions about the, the use of it. No, with cortisone, I've got my doubts as well. Mm. And with cyclism, uh, exactly. you know, I don't, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to be stupid, and I don't want to put all the cyclists in the same, in the, on the same boat. But there was a time where everyone doped. Yeah, and I I doubt that there were there were there were probably a few that didn't do it, and they were the last of the peloton. Yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, so why why don't you legalize it then? Yeah, <laughs> the best doper is the best cyclist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, but, yeah. But then, well, that goes then, for yeah. all sports, really. Yeah, exactly. It's for sports then. I mean, uh, you know, because we do sports, so we play football. Uh, uh, because the nature of sports is just. It's just to play, but play it fairly. Mm. Now, if you want, if you're gonna cheat, don't start doing it. Don't do it. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't make it doesn't make any sense. But then, if everyone does it, and we all know it, legalize it. You know, I was a big fan of Pantani, and I wanted to believe in Marco Pantani every time he took his band off, and he was climbing those mountains. But he was flying up the mountains, and, I, and I'm thinking that this is not possible. I'm a sportsman myself. Mm. I jump on the bike after 50k, I'm, I'm dead. And if I have to climb a mountain and then come down and then again, yeah. it's not, it's impossible. Yeah. I mean, it is impossible. And if you do it, you do it slowly. Yeah. Not at the pace they do it. So come on. Uh, let's just be honest. Let's, let's show your cards uh, out there. If you're doping, say it. Well, as Armstrong was forced to do it. Yeah. Uh, but then there were, there were a lot of cyclists that you got away with murder, that jump retired. Retired before all this, all this EPO and, and all these stories came out. Jumping maybe a little bit too far ahead here, and I know we're skipping over a whole bunch of uh, maybe subtopics that we could be uh, discussing. But uh, do you think the punishment fit the crime, as in him being stripped from all of his titles, Lance Armstrong? That is. Well, yes. I mean that uh, he got stripped of his titles. I think his reputation is 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 that bad. I mean he can't compete in any. Uh, I think in any any cyclist, uh, you know, tours, not even tours, but uh, uh, how do you say it in English? Uh, competiciones domésticas, no? The, the ciclistas. National. No, I don't. Mm. National domestic competition. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, everyone that talks about Armstrong, the first thing that comes to your mind is just a cheetah. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because people believed in him, mm. you know, a cancer yeah. survivor, yeah. you know, coming back from death. Uh, you know, being that uh, you know, seven times uh, Tour de France uh, it, winner. It was. It so was. It, it, it was, was a fraud. It was an absolute fraud. Yeah. Uh, so he deserves uh, what he's getting. All right. Well, uh, Andrea, on that note, I think it's a good time to maybe end it here. Thirty-nine minutes. That's not bad. That's not bad. We're getting. We're getting better to the half hour <laughs> mark, Andrea. Um, listen to all the viewers at home. If you liked it, again, give us a follow at our uh, Twitter handles or Instagram handles, and uh, of course, as well, submit your comments in the comment section. I'll be happy to uh, answer them along with Andrea. If you got any topics that we would like to discuss on future episodes as well, submit them, and uh, Andrea and I. 
I will be happy to uh, discuss them. Andrea, I wish you uh, a good rest of the week, a good day. Thanks so much for your time, and we'll speak again soon. Thank you, Diego. An absolute pleasure. Ciao, ciao. Ciao.